Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson. My lord and my lady, I appear for the defendant appellants together with Simon Burke, King's counsel, and Watson Pringle. Uh, the claimants who are also appellants, of course, on their appeal uh, appear by Tom Weisselberg, King's counsel, together with Tom Cleaver, Will Bordell, and Marlena Val. Uh, my lords and my lady, subject to the court's permission, I propose to address the court on our appeals. Uh, my learned friend, Mr. Burke, will be responding to the claimant's appeal. Uh, we have an agreed timetable. Uh, but uh, in light of the court's free reading, uh, and if I may respectfully say perhaps both the nature and number of interventions from the court, uh, at the moment I don't anticipate taking up all the time allotted to me to open my uh, appeals. Uh, what, 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 what is the timetable that you've agreed? It, it, essentially, we, we can hand up a copy. Um, I've got um, essentially um, three hours, 50 minutes uh, on our appeals, then my learned friend has five hours, 40 minutes in total uh, on both appeals. Uh, and then um, we have uh, one hour, 50 minutes on their appeal. Uh, we have 50 minutes reply submissions on our appeal. And then they have 20 minutes reply submissions on their appeal. All of that takes us to lunchtime on day three. Right. Um, having spoken to my learned friend, we are optimistic, again, depends how the hearing goes. We're optimistic that we will, we may well be able to complete this in two days. We, we share your optimism and indeed have some enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I will take that hint and run with it, if I may. But, well, while, while we're on that topic, um, we will have to have, I'm afraid, a short break morning and afternoon. So I'll leave it to you to choose an appropriate moment. I'm grateful, my lord. Uh, my lord, if I should just then start with a couple of introductory points, if I may, which I hope will be useful in setting the scene. Um, first, uh, we are not uh, in either of our appeals challenging any of the judge's factual findings. Uh, of course, we do, uh, with respect, and I'll, I'll say that once and it can be taken as read thereafter, uh, we do, with respect, challenge the conclusions uh, that she draws as a matter of law from some of those factual findings. Uh, we also take issue with some points which the judge presents without drawing on any evidence as being obvious. Uh, we also point to the lack of evidence for certain points, uh, but we do not, I hope realistically, uh, challenge any of the factual premises or her findings of fact. Uh, accordingly, uh, it follows from that, I hope, that perhaps with one or two exceptions, and it really will be a handful at most, I'm not proposing to take the court to the underlying documents or to the pleadings. Uh, the factual ground in this case is now extremely well trodden. We've had two longish trials. The facts which are relevant to the disputes are set out in the judgments uh, which resulted from those trials. And as the court has seen, each is a fairly substantial judgment. Uh, similarly, as we understand it, uh, the claimant's position on our appeal albeit, of course, with a few forensic flourishes for Mr. Weisselberg, uh, is essentially that the judge was right for the reasons she gave. That's the first introductory point. The second point is that it's important to keep in mind the legal context for the appeal. And here there is a large measure of common ground, as the court will assume. Uh, we accept, of course, that the claimants are entitled to an account of profits. Uh, we were a fiduciary, we've been found to be in breach of fiduciary duty, uh, and that meant that the claimants were entitled to elect for an account of profits, and they did so elect after the phase one trial. The claimant's entitlement to an account of profits brings various advantages to them, uh, such as they get the profits we made even if they wouldn't have been able to make those profits themselves. And therefore, if we were to analyze it in a common law perspective as a matter of damages, they could be said to have suffered no loss. That's not a point you can take on an account of profit. We also accept that there are good, historic, strong policy reasons why a defaulting fiduciary is treated differently to a normal contract breaker. 
Uh, and that is so even in a case like this, where there was no finding of diversion of a business opportunity. That's an important point which I'll come back to. Let alone personal dishonesty in the sense of a fiduciary taking for himself trust assets to which he had no right. In this case, we didn't, for example, take any company property or a customer list or put our hand in the till. Uh, and I note in passing, uh, I'm not going to take the court to it at the moment, uh, that the claimants at several points in their written case refer to a diversion of an opportunity or to the pursuit of the opportunity being a breach. Uh, although, uh, as though, sorry, as though that is what had been found in this case. And to give my uh, Lord and my Lady the references, a few are paragraphs 1, 26, 5, 3, 26, 7, 2 of their written case. Now, what is critical in my respectful submission to bear in mind is that all the judge found in this case was a bad faith resignation. That appears from the phase one judgment at paragraph 424, the references to the supplementary bundle, tab 18, page 255 in the bundle numbering. Uh, she says, and I quote, that breach consisted of what was in essence a bad faith resignation. Now what is a bad faith resignation? The judge goes on to explain it in that paragraph, which the court will have seen. But to summarize, we resigned in bad faith, having taken some small preparatory steps towards pursuing the opportunity ourselves post-resignation, the opportunity being the opportunity to do a deal with the family, in, circum in circumstances where we were otherwise entitled to resign <coughs> and take the opportunity. Now, my lords and my lady, that's really important in my submission. It wasn't taking the opportunity to do a deal with the family that was a breach of fiduciary duty. It wasn't doing the deal that was a breach of fiduciary duty. It was the steps we took prior to resigning. As I say, we see that in the first instance judgment. Um, as I see the court has taken it out, let me just show the court the paragraph I was referring to. It's 424 on page 255 in the internal number. And can I just invite the court, if I may respectfully do so, just to read that paragraph to, to themselves, because this is an important point in the context of the first round of appeal, what I'm calling the 50-50 point for shorthand. Now, which paragraph number? 424, my lord, on page 255. I'll develop this point a little later when we come to the 50-50 point in more detail. But to put it in context, what the claimants were arguing at phase one was diversion of business opportunity. That was their case. They didn't get home on that case. They got home on bad faith resignation. And the reason why that's important is that, it, as I say, doing the deal with the family wasn't a breach of fiduciary duty. It was the steps we took to tee it up before we resigned, which was the breach of fiduciary duty. If we'd resigned without taking those preparatory steps, we would have won phase one, but we didn't. Those preparatory steps, including today, uh, helping to turn the family against... The, the, there were a number of points which the judge found were inconsistent with our fiduciary duties and therefore amounted to breach of fiduciary duties before we resigned for Lord Yes. And so I, I'm going to use the phrase teeing it up, the, the preparatory steps we took. That's, that's what we did wrong in breach of duty. But the critical point, because this will be very important for my 50-50 argument, the critical point is that, as I say, doing a deal with the family wasn't a breach of fiduciary duty. It's not a diversion of opportunity case. But what, but what you did in the preparatory steps beforehand taints all that follows. It, it's why we were in breach of fiduciary duty. 
But and, and I'll develop this point. The question then becomes, you have a breach of fiduciary duty. You have profits which have been made. How do those profits relate to the breach of fiduciary duty? Of course, they're subsequent in time, but post hoc is not ergo propter hoc. That isn't enough to say, and I'll simply as a matter of law as we go through the 50-50 point, because of the bad faith resignation, therefore, all of your profits fall into the profits for which you have to account. And it is, my Lord's, I'll develop this point, but it is, my Lord's, just to make this point now, a, an interesting feature of this case, that we have ended up in the same position as we would have been in had this been a diversion of opportunity case. In other words, if we'd been in breach of fiduciary duty in actually stealing, taking the whole business opportunity, which is precisely what the judge did not find, we'd be in exactly the same position as we are now. And as I'll submit, when I come to the 50-50 argument, the fact that this is a bad faith resignation case, and the fact that absent those preparatory steps, we were entitled always to do a deal with the family, whereas in a diversion of business opportunity case, you were never entitled to take the opportunity for yourself. That's the whole point of a diversion of business opportunity case. It is striking, and we will submit wrong, that we end up in the same position. Having whetted the court's appetite for that point, can I just move on? Because I will be coming back to it in a little more detail uh, later on. So just so I understood yes. it, I, I was having difficulty following you slightly, but you're, you're defining a diversion of business opportunity case as a case in which it is never open to the fiduciary to take advantage of the opportunity. Yes, because it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, his, it's not his opportunity to take advantage on it. It's not available. For him. Rather than in the, the rather more general sense in which it might be being used, which might apply to this case, namely, whilst the fiduciary, your clients, smooth the path by making the opportunity more readily available to them, for them to take once they cease to be fiduciary. I, I, absolutely. That, that's why we have found him in breach of fiduciary duty. I, I can't argue with that. And I'm, I'm, I disavowed in the first 10 minutes arguing. I, I follow that. I, 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 was, I think diversion of business opportunity you were using in a more technical sense than I was understanding it. I, I well, follow that. Well, no, well, Lord, and I, I apologise if I'm using it in an over-technical sense, but the distinction which I'm seeking to draw is, my Lord, an important distinction. Because it, it highlights the fact that in the, the run of the mill, the normal, if I may put it that way, breach of trust or breach of fiduciary case, the fiduciary has got in his pocket something which he was never entitled to have in his pocket, the customer list, the opportunity. He's put his hand in the till. That isn't this case. What we ended up with in our pocket, i.e. a deal with the family, was something which we could have legitimately had in our pocket. I don't understand this. You, of course you had something you weren't entitled to, which is that the moment you resigned, you had um, paved the way, as my lord put it, smoothed the path, using your position in a way that you weren't entitled to. So of course you had something you weren't entitled to. You had, a, you had an opportunity which, uh, you had an opportunity at the moment you resigned, which belonged to the claimant. It didn't belong to you. That, but my, my Lord, with, with respect, no. That, that is precisely what the uh, judge didn't find. That's what they argued for, a diversion of business opportunity case, and that's what the judge did not No, find. no, I'm not talking about the bit. What I'm saying is you had improved your position to enable you to get that, to, to, to get the opportunity which you say would have been open to you, but you'd improved that position in a way that wasn't open to you. And, 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 the, and the, 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 the whole point of this area of law is taking those preparatory steps you should have been taking them on behalf of your um, principal. Or, or joint venturer. Yes. Joint venturer. Yeah. The uh, party to whom you owed a fiduciary duty. That, and you didn't. You took them for your own benefit. And that is why you're in breach of fiduciary duty. And that's why it's not open to you to come to court and say, this was an opportunity which we were, which we, which was open to us to take. It wasn't because you had taken the preparatory steps which should have been taken on behalf of your, of your um, joint venture. Of course, I, I understand my, my Lord's question, and the, the distinction I'm seeking to draw is, is this. In a diversion of business opportunity case, or a customer list case, 
there are no circumstances in which you're entitled to have that customer list in your own pocket. In this case, we were entitled to do a deal with the family for ourselves. That is a critical difference. Why are we in breach of duty? Because we teed it up. Absolutely. That's why we're in breach of fiduciary duty. That's why they're entitled to an account of profits. But with respect, and I'll develop this point later if I may, but it, it simply doesn't follow, I would respectfully submit, as a matter of either logic or law, that one therefore says, well, because you teed it up, all the profits which are earned subsequently fall into the account of profits. That would be, I, I submit, surprising because you would be treating the fiduciary who resigned in bad faith as if the fiduciary had actually was in the same position as a diversion of business opportunity or putting the customer list in the, in the pocket. Now, because I'm running a 50-50 case based on an antecedent agreement, some of the point which my Lord is putting to me and I'm responding on is not going to be necessary for deciding this case. But I didn't, I, I, forgive me, it may be my fault, I, I had understood that there were specific grounds you were appealing on. I hadn't understood that, I hadn't understood that there was some overarching ground, that they, they weren't entitled to a full 100% count because of the way in which you had, because of the nature of the breach of fiduciary duty. I hope it'll become clearer when I make my submissions on the 50-50 because it's important, what we're going to have to do in that context is to answer the question, why, on my case, does the fact that there is an antecedent agreement matter? The judge held that the agreement had to be antecedent, it had to circumscribe the principal's interest in the asset, and it had to be legally binding. Those are reasons why the judge held that our 50-50 case failed. But even on the judge's approach, if we had had an antecedent agreement which circumscribed the principal's interest in the profit and it had been legally binding, then they would only have been able to look to 50%. Now, I want to develop the submissions as to why that is right, but why the judge didn't go far enough. But part of the background is to, uh, is to um, start from the proposition that in this case, the underlying opportunity to do a deal with the family was something which, had we not been in breach of fiduciary duty, would have been available to us. But it's a different opportunity. If, you'd, if you had not been in breach of fiduciary duty, you would have had an opportunity to do a deal with the family. By reason of your breach of fiduciary duty, the opportunity that you had was more favourable, and the opportunity of which the claimant was deprived, therefore, was, at least in part, an opportunity of which it was deprived directly by reason of that fiduciary duty. So I, I quite understand your point that you were, you were entitled to take advantage of an opportunity to deal with the family, but it's not quite the same, is it, as, as saying that this isn't a case where there's been any deprivation of the claimant's opportunity. Well, I, I'm, I'm certainly not quibbling that we in breach of fiduciary duty. Whether we put it in terms of deprivation of the claimant's opportunity or us put, putting ourselves in a better opportunity, better position to take the opportunity, may be two sides of the same coin. I'm certainly not pushing back on that. That's what the judge found, and I've got to, I've got to argue this appeal in light of those findings. Um, I do respectfully say that it is the same opportunity, but we put ourselves in a better position. That's why I, I wouldn't say with respect it's a different opportunity, it's the same opportunity, but we're in a better position to take it. And because we did that before we resigned, we're in breach of fiduciary duty. If we'd done it after we resigned, we wouldn't have lost at phase one. Thank you. But Lord, I, I don't want to get too, too stuck, if I can put it that way, on the underlying policy, because I'm not, I'm certainly not intending to anyway, quibble with the general policy of this jurisdiction towards fiduciaries. Uh, I'm not going to be arguing that Boardman and Phipps is wrong, wrongly decided or Regal Hastings and Gulliver was wrongly decided. I, I, 
I, I, I haven't got permission to do that here. I don't think I can do that in this court anyway. So I'm not, that's no part of my argument. But I do respectfully invite the court not to go down uh, what might be seen as a rather sort of knee-jerk approach, which is you're, you're a fiduciary, you're in breach of fiduciary duty, therefore the book should be thrown at you, and we don't care too much how heavy or how big or how many volumes that book contains. There has to be a careful analysis to make sure that the account of profits is properly referable to the facts of the case and the breach of duty found. And indeed, that, that appears. Let's take the court to, to one case on this point, because it's, it's, it's a case we'll be coming back to. It's, it's the Australian case of Warman, which is the authorities' uh, bundle at tab 13. This is a decision of the um, High Court of Australia. <coughs> and my Lord will have seen, my Lord and Lady will have seen this quoted in our written argument. Uh, if we uh, take it uh, from 369 um, of the bundle reference, I'll try to stick with the bundle references and be consistent. Just after halfway down, uh, I'm not going to, to read it out, but the court will see in that paragraph beginning a fiduciary must account. And then a reference to what the court calls the stringent rule, said to have two purposes. First of all, one might be regarded as sort of a utilitarian purpose, i.e. you've got something which you shouldn't have, you need to hand it back. And the second uh, purpose is uh, pour encourager les autres, you know, to keep people, to keep people honest, if I can put it that way, uh, and perhaps keep people, keep people more honest than the average person. And then uh, over the page, uh, it's no defence that uh, uh, beneficiary was unwilling, unlikely, or unable to make the profits for which an account is taken, or that the fiduciary acted honestly and reasonably. And uh, the court sees they refer to Regal Hastings. Uh, and uh, they uh, also refer in that paragraph to Phipps and uh, Boardman. The analysis then uh, continues on 371. At the top of the page, ordinarily a fiduciary would be ordered to render an account of the profits made within the scope and ambit of his duty. Uh, and then we'll come back to the next paragraph which talks about delay um, and standing by and permitting the defendant to make profits. That's really relevant to the second round uh, of appeal. Uh, just after halfway, it's necessary to keep steadily in mind the cardinal principle of equity. The remedy must be fashioned to fit the nature of the case and the particular uh, facts. Uh, and uh, then if we it up um, at uh, 372. The basic principle remains that a principal who so elects is entitled to an account of profits subject to considerations of the kind already mentioned. Uh, and then on 373, the paragraph beginning in the case of a business. I'm not going to read it out. Uh, but it goes on to establish that um, one has to look at the facts of the case and make sure that the remedy is uh, appropriate. And at 374, as I'm here, at the end of the, uh, just before halfway down the page, as a general rule, in conformity with the principle that the fiduciary must not profit from breach of fiduciary duty, a court will not apportion profits in the absence of an antecedent arrangement for profit sharing, but will make allowance for skill expertise and other uh, expenses. So the reason why I show the court that decision, and there are others which say much the same, indeed the learned judge in her judgment in this case started with a list of considerations which govern the account. 
uh, is to uh, make the point that although uh, we are all familiar with Phipps and Borden and Regal Hastings and Dunham, uh, that is not the end of the discussion. It's the beginning of the discussion. The critical question is uh, how should the account be fashioned in line with the principles of equity in order to take account of the particular facts uh, of the case. Um, with, with that um, introduction, which became a little more substantive than I was intending, um, can I go to uh, my submissions on the first round of our appeal, which is the 50-50 which point? The, the starting point here is that built into, and we accept this, built into the very concept of an account of profit is a potential windfall for the claimant in that they don't have to show losses. They can obtain the profits we made even if it's clear that they wouldn't have made any profits at all. We can't object to that. We do say, however, that the judgment in this case gives the claimants a further windfall to which they are not entitled because 50% of the profits for which the judge ordered us to account to the claimants were profits to which we were always and remain solely entitled. Now, I, I want to start with the judgment, and we'll come to some of the detail in a moment. And I hope it's fair to summarise the judge's conclusions on 50-50 in this way. I'll set out three points, and then I'll take the court in a little more detail to each of them. The first point is, the judge found that there was an agreement, or perhaps to use a neutral word, an arrangement, that ultimately profits would be split 50-50 between the two parties as effective joint venture. Second, she held, as a matter of law, that if that arrangement had been both antecedent and legally binding, and also had operated to limit the claimant's interests in the profits of the venture, then that agreement would operate to circumscribe the scope of the account. Third, she held, however, that the agreement or arrangement was not legally binding and also did not operate to limit or circumscribe the claimant's interest in the venture. And she therefore held, as a matter of law, we were disentitled from bringing it into play to limit the account. Now, given that, the actual scope of the debate on the 50-50 point is therefore relatively narrow. And that's why I hope I wasn't seeking to dodge the question when I answered my Lord Lord Justice Phillips earlier that we, we, I don't need perhaps to go as far as my Lord thought I was going because I'm focusing here on the 50-50. I'm not taking a global point on account of profits. I wanted to set the scene. But my target is the reasons why the judge held against us on the 50-50 point. That is my first round of it. Well, my difficulty was I couldn't see how the points you were raising in, in, in an introductory sense had any bearing on this at all. The, 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 the reason uh, for that is that it's a strong part of my learned friend Mr. Weisselberg's case that the deterrent element, which are all back pocket cases, if I can put it that way, are an answer to our 50-50 point. Throughout his written argument, we see the, you've got to keep people on the straight and narrow, look at Regal Hastings, look at Fordman and Phipps. It's to deal with that, with that point. I probably took too much time on it, and it's probably, I'm sure it's my fault. But the, 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 that, is, that is why we don't, from this side of the court, we don't want the court's focus to be, or the court to think, that the battle here is that he's pro-Regal Hastings and Gulliver, and I'm against it. We both are in favour, we have to be, of Regal Hastings and Gulliver. I think the difficulty may arise because I, I entirely understand your argument that uh, the judge uh, should have found there was a binding agreement and had, had she so found uh, the reasons she gave for rejecting that as a, uh, as a, as a reason for taking it into account were, were wrong, which is what you've just been addressing. But th that comes in your argument as a slightly second 
and fallback point, the primary argument being that the judge found that as a matter of expectation, whether or not there was a binding agreement, that is what would have happened. And it's in relation to, the, to that aspect that I think Mr. Weisselberg majors on that being something which is, is simply contrary to the regal Hastings and, and, and general principle. We, we, but, but you are still pursuing that, are you? We, we, we are. And my Lord, I, I, will, I will develop this. One of the, can I just give my Lord a very short answer now, because I'll develop it later yes. if I may. The short answer is when we talk about a hypothetical agreement, which is what Mr. Malone Friends says we're doing, i.e. what would have happened, we need to be careful what we mean by a hypothetical agreement. We can have an agreement today as to what will happen in certain, if certain events happen in the future. That's not a hypothetical agreement. It's an agreement today as to what happens in the future. You can have an agreement as to um, uh, what, will, what will happen if other events occur. You can have an agreement to agree, and you can have no agreement today, but the court saying, if such and such had happened, you would have agreed that. That's the hypothetical agreement which we say my learned friend is attacking, and which is not part of our case. Our case is not that. If we hadn't been in breach of fiduciary duty, we would have agreed X, Y, and Z. Our case is we had agreed X, Y, and Z. True it is, we'd agreed X, Y, and Z, which would bite if certain events happened in the future. But that's not a hypothetical agreement. Well, it is if it's not a binding agreement. I think it is if it's not a binding agreement, isn't it? That's it, difficult. Anyway, I, I, yes. I've taken you out of the course of your argument, and I don't, I don't want to do that. Yes. But I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to this when, when, when you want to. I, I will. And, and the, the difference if we have a binding or a non-binding agreement is going to be very important. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, let me just show the, uh, the court the material, and I hope I can do this relatively quickly, uh, on the 50-50 uh, point. Um, if we take up the judgment at page 207, at paragraph 424. Um, at 424, uh, the court sees that um, the starting point is the 40% deal the claimants accept that it was agreed prior to the split that Mr. Rikadze would receive 40% of the profits. And then 425, I'm not going to read all this out, but if the court, uh, in what counsel laughably called the court's spare time, um, could pick up 425, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and 30. Well, we have, uh, you, you can take it that we have read what we were asked to read. I'm, I'm very grateful. On your agreed reading list. And then 431, if I can just highlight 431. The reality, second sentence, the reality of the situation, while no formal agreement was in place with the common understanding of the breaches, that we would have the right to essentially 50%. Uh, and then that's picked up again at uh, 434. If all had gone forward, this is what would most likely have happened. And um, on this point, we don't understand the claimants to take issue with that at certain points in the claimant's written argument, we do submit that two different points are elided. One, was there an agreement or arrangement in fact? And two, was that agreement or arrangement a binding contract in law? For example, we say that appears a number of times in the Learned Friends' written argument, but uh, it's perhaps clearest at paragraph 17, uh, where they say, the defendants confirm they do not challenge any of the judge's factual findings. In those circumstances, there's no room for any challenge to the judge's conclusion that there was no agreement. Well, with respect, I, I can not challenge, I can avoid challenging the judge's factual findings and still make my respectful submission a submission that as a matter of law, there is an agreement. We'll come to the point a little later if we need to, as to whether that is a binding of fact or law. I'm not sure it matters. For these purposes. Um, but the um, learner judge was plainly right to find, because the evidence was overwhelming, it was almost common ground in both trials, some are subject to some minor wrangling about precise percentages, uh, that, um, that there was that uh, arrangement. Now, that arrangement was neither a conditional or future 
nor was it an agreement to agree, nor was it a hypothetical agreement. And to, to pick up the point which my Lord Lord Justice Popwell put to me a few moments ago, a conditional or future agreement is on the along the lines of saying, if X or Y or Z happen, then we'll agree something. Um, that's not what we have here. Here we have a present agreement, which we submit is legally binding now, I'll come to that, but comes into commercial effect once there is something for the agreement to bite on. And I mean, that's not that's not controversial, that's not difficult. I can agree, uh, I can agree with my learned junior how we're going to split our lottery winnings, uh, even if we haven't yet won, uh, even if we haven't yet bought a ticket. That's not a future agreement in the legal sense. I mean, there are uh, there are legal systems where you can't make an, an agreement today about something which doesn't yet exist. Uh, so you can't, for example, have an agreement today as to uh, selling your crop for next year if that crop hasn't yet grown. There are such legal systems. English law isn't one. In the context of a joint venture, uh, as we have here, an agreement between joint venturers as to how they're going to split the profits is not a future agreement just because no profits have yet been made, or because the joint venturers haven't yet concluded a contract with their counterparty. The agreement between them may be binding or not, that's a different point, but if it is a binding agreement, it's a present rather than a future agreement. The agreement is also said by uh, Milena Trend to be hypothetical, in the sense that we're relying on an agreement which would have been formed between the parties in a world where we were not in breach of fiduciary duty and we hadn't committed the bad faith resignation. Uh, as to that, and I'll develop this point by reference to the authorities, our case is not based on a hypothetical agreement which would have been agreed in some alternative reality. Our case is that they had already reached an agreement in the real world, which applied and continues to apply as between them in relation to the relevant profits. We say, and I'll explain why, that that was a legally binding agreement, uh, but certainly was an agreement or arrangement, and it was never argued by the claimant, let alone held by the judge, that that agreement immediately terminated and fell away once we were in breach of fiduciary duty. I'll come back to the automatic revocation point uh, later. Uh, but on the contrary, we say therefore that the consequences of our breach of fiduciary duty and the appropriate remedy have to be assessed in light of that antecedent agreement or as we would say, that binding uh, contract. What was that? What, what, what do you say actually is the nature of the agreement? It's an agreement that we will uh, we will pursue a, a deal with the family. We haven't yet agreed. It was clear they hadn't yet agreed how their joint venture was going to be structured. But however it was going to be structured, we were going to pursue a deal with the family and we were going to split the proceeds 50-50. That's the essential agreement. That's not quite what the judge says, is it? Well, Paragraph 431 is really her finding, which doesn't describe it as either an agreement or an arrangement, but as a common understanding. Ne never mind that, that we, that's what it is, and that it's to be uh, somewhere in the region of 50%. Yes. The, I, I, as I said earlier, there, there was certainly a um, uh, some quibbling about the precise percentages. Uh, but by the time, um, we'll, we, we can see this elsewhere, by the time it came to the phase one trial, um, the uh, essential agreement was a 50-50 split. Uh, it, had, it had moved uh, over the, the, the period, uh, started at 40, uh, and uh, we say went to, went to 50. Um, I, I, um, if, if my Lord sees in 432 what the, the judge says, uh, what she says in 431, it's reflected, Iraqi and his team would have perfected their interest in 50% of the recovery proceeds. And the judge is regarding that as reflecting what she says in 431. So we, we do submit, uh, and of course the court will read the judgment for itself, we do submit that fairly read, 
uh, what uh, the parties had agreed here was uh, essentially a 50-50 split of, of profits. Can I, can I understand the, the basics of this contract, the parties to it? You say it's 50% rather than put to one side the quibbling. I think you're saying it's a 50%. Yeah. Who are the parties? There's, there's, there's the, there are basically two, two teams, if I can put it that way. Yes. There's a Jaffe yes. team. Who are the, who are the contractors? The, Mr. Mr. Jaffe and Mr. Ricadzi are the lead people on each side. What's happening at this stage is that, and we accept this, the structure of how they are going to structure the joint venture is in flux. But we do respectfully submit that that is not inconsistent. Indeed, we say it's entirely consistent with an, an, an agreement that we are going to, however we structure this, we are going to split the profits. 50-50. You will have 50% of the profits, and I will have 50% of the profits. Okay. Who, 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 the, the agreement is between Mr. Jaff and Mr. Ricketti. Yes. And who is the you and the we in your in your the, the, sentence? The, 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 Jaffe, the Jaffe team, so to speak, and the Ricketti team. We, the, Miss, Mr. Jaffe would be entitled... Pell Mallon, Pell Mallon Park Street. Yes. Uh, but but, but uh, if Mr. Jaffe wanted to set up a separate SPV on his side of the deal, that wouldn't change the nature of the agreement. The nature of the agreement here is that here we have a potential deal with the family, which we want to exploit. We would exploit it together, and we will cut the cake 50-50. That's the way None of this seems to me to come even remotely close to sufficient certainty of parties or subject matter or detail to amount to a binding agreement. You might say there was a broad understanding of what sort of agreement they would ultimately put in place. But I mean, as I understand it, it's not even clear whether this would be in the form of some form of remuneration, or whether it would be by way of dividends, or would it be a, an equity interest? Uh, um, it's all completely up in the air, isn't it? Well, my Lord, the, the, the learned judge set out in the judgment her reason for why she didn't find there to be a binding contract. And um, to pick up the point which my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell put to me, our primary case is binding contract. Um, what I was proposing to do was deal with those reasons that the judge said, well, having found what I found as a matter of fact, I now ask myself the question, does this amount to a binding contract? And what I propose to do is to look at those reasons and make my submissions on them. My submission is going to be, it won't come as any surprise, that those reasons are not good reasons, and therefore the court should proceed on the basis that there was a binding contract. If, of course, any member of this court has a, another reason as to why there isn't a binding contract, I, I'll deal with it at that point. But that's where I was going to well, I think the starting point is, when you're telling us there's a binding contract and the court's saying to you, well, who are the parties? What was the subject matter of it? What were, it? what were its terms? If you can't answer those questions in a way that indicates there was a binding contract, then I, I thought we got a very short shrift at the point, haven't we? Well, but Lord, no, because that, that's the, the learned judge didn't say there's no binding contract because I can't identify who the contracting no, parties are. No, but you're what you're saying is there are facts here upon which we can say there was a binding contract, even though the judge concluded that there wasn't. No, but what no. are the facts? No, my lord, I, I haven't. No, my, my submission is not that. With, with respect, my submission is the judge set out why she held there was no binding contract, which I'm going to come to. When we analyse those reasons, which are legal reasons why there is no contract, or well, one of them is a, a point which she says is so obvious it doesn't need any reasoning or evidence. I'll come to that. When we analyse those reasons with respect, they do not withstand scrutiny. What's this about the games playing? A bit what? It's games playing to say, I, I don't want to have to address the question about whether there's a binding contract here, but if I can show you the judge's reasons for saying there weren't, um, don't hold water, then, then you must find that there was a binding contract. I think you need to show us what the facts are, which you say which should lead us to conclude that there was a binding contract. Well, I'm, I'm standing on the basis of what the judge said. The judge said, I've made findings of fact, and now ask myself the question. Does, does that amount to a binding contract? And it doesn't for these reasons. Well, it, it's, 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 the way, it's the right way of looking at this. You, you, you accept you can't challenge findings of fact. Exactly. You, you're 
going to point us to what you say are the errors of law in the approach the judge made as to whether there was or was not a binding agreement. If you're right about that, that leaves potentially two possibilities, doesn't it? Exactly. One is that the matter has to be remitted if it's going to be determined to the outcome of the, uh, of the outcome to the judge to make a fresh decision. The other is that this court makes a decision on the underlying evidence without making those errors of law that you say were made by the judge. Yep. Now, as I understand it, you're suggesting the second of those, yes. in which case we do have to do the, the exercise that my lord says, which is looking at all the underlying material, which we don't have, and you persuading us on the basis of all that underlying material, which we don't have, that there was in fact a binding agreement. I have some difficulty with that myself, as you can see from the way I've put the question. <laughs> my lord, that, that, that point was not, not lost on me. <laughs> um, and it, it, it may be, it may be therefore, that if I if I can't persuade the court uh, that uh, showing the uh, errors in the judge's reasoning uh, is sufficient, because the judge certainly uh, was uh, prepared, absent those reasons, to find that there was a binding contract, she identified very precisely the reasons why she said there was no binding contract. If I can't persuade this court that it should, and perhaps more importantly, can, <coughs> which I think was the burden of my Lord's point, can look, go into and look at the underlying material, because the problem is it's not before the court, then we may be in the situation of having to say, well, that point then will have to go back. I don't want to get there, because my primary position is the judge here says, essentially in terms, I found that there was this arrangement. It's not a binding contract for these legal reasons. And I certainly didn't understand Malone's friend, although, of course, the court can take any point it wants. I didn't understand Malone's friend to be saying, well, despite that, there are a whole host of other reasons why there is no contract here, even if you, I, us, succeed in attacking the particular reasons identified by, by the learned judge. Um, I was going to come to the two um, legal points as to why the judge, on which the judge found uh, against us. Um, uh, before that, I was going to um, deal. This might be again, and if I'm repeating myself, I apologise, but it is an important part of this case with the principal point taken by my learned friend, which is the regal Hastings point. Um, Malern Friend takes, he does take this point as a point of principle against my 50-50 argument. And that's why we, get, we got on to this exchange about Regal Hastings. Uh, Malern Friend does take the point that a fiduciary needs to be deterred from breaching its duties. And he submits it's contrary to policy to allow a fiduciary to retain <coughs> profits, which the fiduciary would have made even if there's no breach. And it's at that point that the 50-50 argument ties in to the rather more abstract exchange which I was having with my Lord Lord Justice Phillips. Now, we have a primary answer to this and an alternative answer. The primary answer is that none of the authorities mentioned by the claimant deals with the situation where there is a binding actual rather than hypothetical profit share agreement which applies to the profits which have actually been made. Where that is the case, the rules in relation to account of profits, including the deterrent policy, simply don't apply to the fiduciary's share of the profits because those are profits to which the fiduciary was always and still is entitled for its own account. The claimant can obtain from the fiduciary the profits which the fiduciary made, regardless of whether the claimant could or would have made those profits. The law that we have to give an account of profits bites on that. We can't take that away. But the claimant we submit can't take profits 
which the claimant has agreed with the fiduciary would always be the fiduciary's, unless the claimant can show that such agreement fell away or was automatically terminated on the fiduciary's breach. I'll come to that point, but it isn't this case. Those sums, i.e. the 50%, which the uh, beneficiary agreed with the fiduciary that the fiduciary could have, are monies which have inured to the fiduciary subsequent to the breach of duty. But for the purposes of an account of profits, they're not profits at all. They're certainly not profits referable or attributable to the breach. And that's our primary answer. And I put it as a matter of principle because that's what it is. And those, the cases which we uh, all know uh, so well, uh, none of them are cases where there's an antecedent uh, binding agreement. Well, is that really right? I mean, we have m many cases. Let's take, for example, a um, a director with a large salary and um, perhaps rights to bonuses diverts an opportunity for himself that should have been the company's. Is he subsequently able to say, well, okay, I've got to account for you for the profits, but I have an antecedent entitlement to a million pound a year and a bonus of five million. So Although I've got to account to you for the profits, you've got to give me, you've got to give an allowance to me of six million because um, that's what I would have been entitled to as an antecedent agreement for running this very business. The answer to that is absolutely not because those, that salary and that, that bonus was payable on account of loyalty. That's your loyal payment for your loyal services. That's an antecedent agreement for a share of a share of the profits, and you can't tell us because you say it wasn't agreed that this wasn't remuneration, or by way of a bonus, or structured that way. So why isn't it exactly the same thing? Well, look, it, it, it's not exactly the same thing. Certainly, the starting point is not exactly the same thing because uh, it's interesting that my lord has taken a diversion of opportunity. Case. Okay, well, that's imagine a situation where preparatory steps were taken. Yes. Well, that's this case. Yeah. Okay, but why isn't, why isn't it exact? Why would the director be entitled to credit for the salary and bonus that had been agreed, but which ultimately he didn't earn because he had left and taken the maturing business opportunity? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure with respect that that is analogous to our case here. I mean, what what we have in our case here is that. Um, we have pursued the business opportunity, which A, we were entitled to pursue had we not had a bad faith resignation, uh, and, and was precisely what the subject matter of the agreement was, i.e. to pursue the opportunity as a JV. We've earned profits from it. The claimant agreed with us, we say, on a binding basis that we could have 50% of those profits. On, on the basis that you were, you were acting loyally in, in, in a fiduciary uh, relationship with them? Absolutely, my lord. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to be coming to that precise point. If my lord is putting to me, was there a term, express or implied, in the agreement between us that if we acted in breach of fiduciary in any way, in any way at all, we would be disentitled. No, no, that's, the not, entire that's not what I'm putting to you at all. What I'm saying to you is that, that what I'm saying to you is that in many situations, a fiduciary uh, may have had some arrangement entitling them to payments from uh, the, um, the party to whom they own fiduciary relations. Um, but to say that once they have breached the fiduciary duty, they are entitled to credit for <coughs> payments. Seems to me to be difficult. Well, it's all going to turn on. We're talking. We're dealing with contract here. It's all going to turn on what the what the what the terms of the contract are. Well, well, we are. Of course, we are. But equity is operating against a background of a contractual agreement. Um, and my submission is that there is no case where there is an antecedent binding agreement 
where the courts have approached it in the way my Lord is, is putting to me. And the reason for that is we're not, when, when there is that antecedent binding agreement, 50% of the profits are profits which the claimant had always agreed the fiduciary could have. Not 50% of the profits are profits which, had everything gone okay, the claimant and the fiduciary would have agreed the well, fiduciary all, could have. They all, had agreed. Always agreed he could have if uh, he performed his duties as a fiduciary and earned the profits for the benefit of the, the other party. Well, again, with, 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 with respect, with, my Lord puts that to me, always agreed if. Hmm. Now, that does go back to the answer which I gave my Lord, Lord yes. Jesus Phillips. Always agreed if, necessarily, and that's why I did say it's a matter of contract, Yes, yeah. and, and I, I wasn't ignoring we're in an equitable field, but the, the point that's I, I been think I, under, I think I understand what you're saying. In my Lord's example, it would be necessarily implicit in the contract of employment that if, if he took the, the preparatory steps which we're positing, then he would lose his entitlement to his bonus and his money. Whereas you say in this case, uh, if you'd asked Mr. Jaffa and Mr. Rukadze before breach of fiduciary duty took place, but after they'd reached this agreement... Or at the time uh, of reaching the agreement. At the time of reaching the agreement, uh, which is before the, the breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, if you'd asked them, uh, will uh, the, um, the Park Street team still be entitled to 50% if they breach duties by turning the family uh, against uh, the uh, SICP, I've forgotten the acronym, uh, then uh, I, I'm sure Mr. Jaff would have said yes, of course. Uh, and would Mr. Rakadzi? I might well have done. Doesn't it work both ways? So if there was a contract, as you say, you've got to deal with the point that the you've got to maintain that the contract didn't terminate when the relationship broke down, uh, which would indicate that your clients always had an obligation, in your case, to account for 50%. Because... You're saying that there was always a deal, and there is still a deal for a 50-50 split. But the, but the relationship broke down, and the parties went their separate ways. The relationship broke down, but the, the question is whether the contract terminated <laughs> on, on breach of fiduciary duty. I mean, there were, there were two points of, so to be contractual principle, which we put against me, and I'm going to do it. One is to say, um, the contract automatically terminates and is revoked on breach of fiduciary duty. The second way is to say, there's obviously no express term, the second is to say, which I understood was the burden of my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell's point, which was the answer I was trying to give to my Lord Justice Phillips, but my Lord put it better, which is, you have to analyse it and say, well, if there's no express term, is there an implied term? But the implied term would have to be, um, there's, there's an implied term that if you act in breach of fiduciary duty, no matter what the breach is, you're in breach. Does any breach of fiduciary duty disentitle you to the entirety of fifty percent? No, I don't think so. The question is, the question is, assuming you've got a binding agreement in the first place. Yes. Did the parties at the time agree that it, if what in fact happened should happen, you should it should continue and you should still get the fifty percent? Implied terms have to have to be fashioned. To cover we don't even know what express terms. We don't even know what express terms were. So how can we get into the implied terms? Well, we don't. We don't know whether this was going to be an employment, a, a, employment contract, or whether it was going to be uh, some form of dividend arrangement. I mean, if it's an employment contract, then it would be subject to all these problems. And but my lord, with the uh, I, I'll come back to this. But my lord, the, the idea that uh, English law has some problem with two joint venturers coming together and saying, we are going to set up a joint venture. We don't know exactly how we're going to structure it. I'm not sure which company of mine I'm going to use. You're not sure which company of yours you're going to use. We may situate it here. We may situate it there. We could structure it this way. But one thing we're agreed. It's 50-50. Well, I've no problem, That's no problem. No problem at all in recognising that may have been a general understanding. The great problem in saying that it's binding until the parties have reduced it to some form of... Um, uh, some form of legal content. 
Well, lots of, at, at the time, with, with, with the parties engaged in these sort of transactions, everything was done on a 50-50 basis. It was a, almost a, almost a well-known phrase in the, in the, uh, in the field, 50-50. Everything's 50-50, but... Equity is equality. But we're, what, what, what happens is that that's the general understanding, but it's thereafter put into a properly binding format. And these, these were all matters which were fully capable of being um, uh, documented and, and uh, um, uh, formalized. And none of that had been done here. But and isn't that what the judge says? Yes, in, well, uh, that formality isn't that what the judge says in 435? If all had gone forward, that's most likely what would happen. But there was no agreement. I mean, they just didn't get to the stage of, of formalising this arrangement. They didn't get to the stage of formalising it in the sense of um, agreeing the entire structure. I, I accepted that. Any structure. Any structure. But but what, the, was, what was the structure? The, 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 but for the purposes of the agreement we're focused on, which is the agreement that they were going to divide the profits 50 it doesn't make a difference as to whether the structure was going to be A, B, or C. Well, I think it does because I think you accept that if it was done, if it was going to be done by way of employment contract, then you would have implied duties of, of loyalty. Well, you you would have implied duties of loyalty, but the question still would remain whether you'd be disentitled to any of your fifty percent on a breach of fiduciary duty. You still come back to the same point. No, you'd lose your right to fifty-fifty if you cease to be employed. Depends how that's structured as well. Yeah, but it's unlikely they were going to carry on paying 50 50 to an ex employee. In... Well, it depends what the ex employee is. I mean, if, if the ex employee is a, is a joint venturer and you've uh, done the deal together, then uh, with respect, I don't accept that it's unusual. But th th there's no suggestion here that it was going to be done by way of employment. The, the, the way this was structured was that there were two groups. And they were doing a deal between the two. And what we can see is that the deal was on the basis of 50-50. Of and that's why, for example, that uh, uh, the learner judge says, well, Mr. Jaffe was able to allocate the 50% on his side as he wanted. Well, absolutely. He was able to do that. He could play with his 50% the way he wanted to play with it. He couldn't play with our 50%. Sorry, can I just... Be clear, you, you talk about his 50%, but didn't the judge find at the first trial that this was an opportunity of SCPA? Yes. So we do need to be a little bit careful of how we describe this, but it wasn't, as per the phase one trial, Mr. Jeff's own opportunity that he was providing that. No, the, 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 the point I was on here was a slightly different point, which is the judge in, in, in the second phase held, but, but can I come back to that? Yes. So I'm going to come to that when I come to the okay. judge's uh, uh, reasons. Will the court just give me one moment just to spend one time? <coughs> um, Lords, can I um, make one point? And then that might be a good point to create. Let me see what the time is. Twenty to twelve. Um, let me try and make the next point before we break, if I may. Um, I made the point of principle. Um, the second point I wanted to make was that an account of profits arises in different areas uh, of the law, and we do submit that you have to distinguish between two types of cases. And I, I touched on this earlier. The first type of case is where the defaulting fiduciary or trustee has actually taken assets of the trust or of the joint venture and has got them in their back pocket. Or they've received money from a third party where such receipt itself constitutes a breach of trust, such as a secret commission. Uh, in those cases, the fiduciary or trustee has actually received money which they should have handed over to the principal, but hasn't. That's an unauthorised profit, to use the language of ultra 
uh, which is uh, referred to by the learner judge at paragraph 239C of the judgment. And in those circumstances, what the law says is you've got to reconstitute the trust, you've got to hand it back or hand it over. And in those circumstances, the fiduciary can't say, even if I'd done everything right, I would have been given 30%, let's say, of that sum. The law says no, you've got to hand it back or hand it over. You might get an allowance, but that's a different principle, a different point. The allowance doesn't circumscribe the account of profits. It's merely a recognition that although the claimant is entitled to everything, the fiduciary gets an allowance to recognise the work he's put in. That's the first type of case. It covers all of the older authorities which are relied on by the claimant. And as I say, the starting point is you've got something which necessarily isn't yours and you should never have had. And therefore, all other things being equal, you've got to give it back. The second type of case... But just, sorry, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. No, no, sorry. Uh, it's my fault. I, the, the, the causes of action were included, causes of action, did they in knowing receipt, constructive trust against the company? Yes. Well, how are those different from what you've just been describing? The, 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 the cause of action which they succeeded on was breach of fiduciary duty. Well, I, was, I was just asking you whether they, uh, that, 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 was the, uh, that was the breach of trust that, that meant there was a constructive yeah. trust yeah. that they, gave rise to a knowing receipt yeah. liability. But uh, a knowing receipt liability is a liability uh, to um, disgorge property which you ought not to have received. Yes, I, absolutely. Can I, can I come I, back? I wasn't quite understanding how that's different from the category you've just been putting as your separate category. Can I come back to that point after the short break? Because I just want to make sure I've, I'm not going to say the wrong misleading yes, course yes, on, on what the judge found on that. Let, let me just, if I may, just identify the second type of case, but I will come back to that point after the short break. The second type of case is where the defaulting fiduciary or trustee has not taken anything from the trust, but has acted in breach of trust. The fiduciary may not have acted dishonestly. The claimant may not have suffered any loss and in damages terms, may have no recoverable loss. But the law says, well, we don't mind about that. You can still get an account of profits. But that brings into sharp focus what profits has the fiduciary made which are actually referable to the breach. And we say in this case, we have in our possession nothing which we took from or belonged to the principal. We've acted in breach of fiduciary duty. We've subsequently made a profit. But the question is, how are those two related? How is our profit related to our breach of fiduciary duty? And that, that is why I started by reminding the court that the wrong here, the breach of fiduciary duty, was the bad faith resignation. This wasn't a case uh, which the diversion of business opportunity cases are, where in no circumstances could you take the opportunity for yourself. It's simply not uh, a a available. Lord, I was going now to turn to the particular legal point on which we lost before the judge. That might be a suitable point yes. for a short break. We'll take a short break. <laughs>
Would you ever pay Roger Atkins into a new one? Not yet. Good luck. Okay. They've got the point. Yeah. 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 some of the words. Can I just pick up my Lord's point on knowing the seat and give my Lord a, a ten second response? And it may be that after the short adjournment, I, I may say a little more about it. Um, the knowing receipt was found against the corporate defendants. Um, they were found to have received profits, which itself, which themselves resulted from a breach of fiduciary duty. But that doesn't tell us anything about the nature of the breach of fiduciary duty or whether it's analogous or not to a misappropriation of assets case. So the, the knowing receipt finding is to that extent dependent on and parasitic on the breach of fiduciary duty finding. It wasn't, there wasn't a separate knowing receipt finding of, of a hand in the till case or a, or a misappropriation of assets case. Uh, my Lords, I was going to turn to the legal points on which the judge found against us. Uh, let me start with circumscribing the interest uh, point. I start with that because at paragraph 422 of the judgment, the learner judge uh, referred to this as a threshold point. Uh, that's at 422, page 206 in the internal number. What, what is striking, my lords, about this part of the judgment, and in particular that paragraph 422, uh, is that there is no overt reasoning. Uh, what is it, I ask rhetorically, that justifies the use of the word therefore in the last sentence? Uh, or to put it uh, another way, what is the force of the effectively in the second line? We, we would recast this and say that the principle uh, as to antecedent agreements would relate to agreements which effectively define the extent of each party's interest. And for the reasons we've set out in paragraph 23 of our written argument, where we gave a series of uh, examples, uh, we do respectfully submit that the judge's approach leads to arbitrary distinctions. Now, as I was saying before the short Break. The parties had not agreed the precise corporate structure. They were saying there are various ways we can set this up and structure it and contract with the family. But however we do it, it's going to be 50-50. Uh, and uh, therefore, whatever structure is ultimately adopted, our interest in the profit uh, was always going to be uh, 50%. Uh, and we, we've sought to show that the uh, judge's approach leads to arbitrary distinctions by our worked example, as I say, at paragraph 23 of our skeleton. Now, in response, Malone Friend takes 
a point which uh, has echoes, if I may say respectfully, of some of the points my Lord Lord Justice Phillips was putting to me earlier, which is, well, there's a difference between, for example, having a 20% uh, shareholding in a JV company and having a 20% economic interest in the profits. Um, so that's my answer is, well, of course they're different. I'm not, I'm not arguing they're, they're the same. The question in a equitable field such as account of profit, the question in this field is, is the distinction a relevant distinction? Is it a relevant distinction? Of, of course, there are lots of areas of law where, where that distinction is going to be very important, if not determinative. For example, if we posit an intervening insolvency, or we ask a question about tax treatment. Um, there may be differences in other areas as well. You may have to uh, declare, uh, in some circumstances, a shareholding, but not declare publicly your interest in an account of profits. There, there can be distinctions. The question, therefore, for this court, which, with respect, my learned friend uh, don't, doesn't grapple with, is in the context of an account of profits, where equity is identifying the profits which the fiduciary has to disgorge. And equity is saying to the claimant, no, you can't get profits which you'd agreed that the fiduciary would be able to retain anyway. Why should it make any difference whether the profit share is an equity interest or an economic interest? Because as I say, the judge, the judge accepts it, and we submit she was right to accept that if there had been an antecedent binding agreement, and it did circumscribe the principal's interest in the uh, uh, profit, that would have been enough. She, she didn't find against us, if I can put it this way, on the overarching point. She accepted that there are cases, and there can be cases, where um, the, uh, if the contract had been as she uh, identified, that would have been enough. So that is our short response to a short point, which is that the agreement has to define the extent of the principal's interest. But we, we, we submit respectfully that that leads to arbitrary distinctions and is a not a relevant distinction uh, when we're talking it's about... A very, it's a very sensible distinction, because if, if, if uh, the claimant owns 50% of the business, and you own the other fifty percent of the business. Then, if you take if you, if you take to yourself um, a business opportunity, uh, you haven't taken a hundred percent. You've only taken their fifty percent because you already had fifty percent. So, so I'm quite see in that situation, if you own fifty percent of the business, it's quite sensible to say, well, you should you shouldn't have to account to the other side for a fifty percent that they didn't own. You only account to them for the fifty percent that they did own. Whereas, if they own a hundred percent, but were obliged to, um, or might be obliged to, well, would um, pay to you a part, part of their profit. If you then take the whole of that opportunity to yourself, then that's a very different position because you have you have taken the whole of the opportunity. Well. First, I apologise for interrupting. Um, my Lord said, might have to. I mean, let, let's, obviously we need to look at these points individually. So we're working on this basis that there is a binding agreement. So we should say would have to. But, but my main answer to, to my Lord's point is, well, why with respect is that a relevant distinction? In both cases, you end up with the fiduciary has made £100,000 profit. The fiduciary was always going to be able to retain £50,000, both in my Lord's first case and my Lord's second case. I accept by different methods, but the beneficiary, the beneficiary was never going to be able, I wasn't sure my case was that shocking, <laughs> my, my, the, be, the beneficiary was never going to be able to obtain the whole 100000 In one case, because they'd agreed, we own this company 50-50, I think my Lord is uh, positing a, an equitable a 50-50 share of the shareholding, for example. In the second case, because I've agreed to give you 50% of whatever profits we make. Why ask rhetorically, should that make a relevant difference in equity in an account of profits? Well, because in the first instance, it is 
it is a question of ownership and you own 50% each. In the second case, uh, the share of profits going to your client is uh, arises from their role in relation to the company or whatever vehicle is used uh, and is a payment for their services, loyalty, whatever, to the company. But, and it's, it's, a, it's a completely different arrangement. And, and what we're looking at here, ultimately, we may be principles of equity, but we're really looking at, effectively, questions of property. Well, my Lord, I, I accept it's different. I, I'm not sure whether the word completely adds, adds much. I accept it's different. Obviously, I accept it's different. But okay. it, well, completely it, different, it does, you lose. <laughs> yes. It, it, it does lead to striking distinctions. I mean, in this case, for example, if the parties have said, well, we'll set up SCPI, we'll, have, we'll own that 50-50, you end up with one result. If you say SCPI will be owned by one party, and but um, it will put all the profits, it will put all the profits into another company, and that company is owned 50-50, then you get a very different result. There's no, with respect, there's no reason why the results should be any different in that second there's no reason why the results should be different in any case. The, the, the account of profits is, is not meant to be penal. It's not meant to provide windfall. In both cases, the reason why, in my respectful submission, the beneficiary only gets 50% is because he had agreed to allow the fiduciary to retain 50%. That's why he doesn't get the other 50%. The, the way in which that agreement operated uh, is, is, in my submission, uh, irrelevant uh, for, for these purposes, but underlining for these purposes. Of course, I'm not saying, the court will agree, I'm not saying they're the same. Of course, they're different. The question is whether there's a relevant distinction. Um, that's my answer to the first point, which was the judge's threshold point. As to whether the agreement has to be binding, we have three points. Um, they will ultimately lead broadly to the same conclusion, but we accept, obviously, by different legal routes. Let me identify the three to the court and then develop them, develop them so the court knows where I'm going. The first argument is that the agreement does not have to be binding. The second argument is, if it has to be binding, it was. The third argument is, if it has to be binding, but it wasn't, it's still the best evidence when we come to the equitable allowance. And just to highlight to the court, the court will appreciate on that last point, there's something of an overlap between that point and the point on the claimant's appeal. So I'm going to try to make sure that I stay on the right side of that line, but it may be that some of the points that the court puts to me there will actually be answered by, by my learned friend, Mr. Burt, on, on, when he replies to the first point, does it have to be legally binding? Um, the judge's finding is that there was no binding agreement, uh, but she did find that the 50% of profits that we would have got if all had gone forward absent the breach. So therefore, when it comes to identifying which profits we should pay over, we say that equity shouldn't require us to pay over profits which represent that part of the profits which the claimants have told us we could retain, and which in any universe where these profits were earned as part of an ongoing JV, i.e. no fiduciary breach, we would in fact have retained. Respondents that, make the point, uh, it seems to me it's one a clear answer to, if you're right about this, then uh, parties would have absolutely no deterrent from acting in breach of fiduciary duty because you'll always get what you're entitled to anyway. So you can, you, you, you've got a shot to nothing. You take, you take the opportunity, um, and if you, it all goes well, you get 100% of it. But if you're caught out and lose, you still get the 50% you've got anyway. So effectively what you're saying is you, you, there's no deterrent effect on you, might as well have a go. The, the, the reason why that um, uh, isn't correct uh, is that um, 
the starting point when you're talking about an account of profits at all is that you're in a much worse position deliberately as a matter of policy if you're having to pay over under an account of profit than you are as damages, i.e. The, 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 the court, the, for example, the causation rules. You that's not an answer to the point. Well, it, it's, it's the beginning of an answer to the point. That, 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 is, that is the first point. The second point is, I, as I've identified earlier, we do draw a distinction between cases where you've taken something which you could never have had, which was not something to which you could ever be entitled a hand-in-the-till case, a diversion of business opportunity case, and a case like this, where the only breach of fiduciary duty is a bad faith resignation. And it may well be, it may well be, it's not, it doesn't arise for determination in this case, but it may well be that the distinction to be drawn is to be drawn between cases where you took something to which you were never entitled, where you have to, as I said earlier, you have to reconstitute, and cases where, as this case, you did something wrong, and that was a breach of fiduciary duty, but what you went on to do was something which you were entitled to do. You would have been entitled to do it absent the bad faith resignation. That, that may also be the answer to my Lord's point, because my Lord is putting to me, again, a diversion of business opportunity case, which is which is frankly the more usual and regular case. So that no, the, 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 what, 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 what has happened here is that there's a breach of fiduciary duty in preparing, preparing the opportunity for when you resign. Yes. And that's why you have to account. Yes. And the point is, when, when somebody is considering whether to prepare to take an opportunity that should have been uh, inured to the benefit of uh, the principle, yes. um, is it right that they can say to themselves, well, um, I've got nothing to lose here because if I don't take this opportunity, I will get 50%. If I do get it, if I do take it, if I do prepare it and then resign and take the opportunity, um, the worst that can happen to me is that I get my 50%. How, how is that a sensible, equitable position to impose on fiduciary. Well, well one, one, can, one can put that, um, that therefore, even if, the, the, as I understand it, the logical extension of that point, therefore, is that even if one has an antecedent agreement which circumscribes the extent of the fiduciary, of the principal's interest in the JV or in the uh, opportunity, and it's a binding agreement and isn't automatically revoked, then that, that agreement itself wouldn't entitle the fiduciary to 50%. In which case, my lord, I, I see where my lord is coming from, but my lord has to appreciate it. Your lordship is going much further than the judge now in the case, because the judge accepted that if there was an antecedent agreement which was binding and circumscribed the principle of interest, that would operate. No, but that's a different, that's a different situation, it seems to me, because there you're not taking hundred percent. You're only taking the fifty that you don't already own. Well, we're talking. That, let's just stick to the. Let's just stick to the situation we are. We're talking about here, which is where there isn't an antecedent interest uh, agreement as to the interest, but an antecedent agreement as to a profit share. Why in that situation? Why was, should equity countenance a situation where the fiduciary can act in breach of fiduciary duties without? Any risk? Because the because in both cases, and I, I'm afraid I do need to um, bring into play my answer the the uh, the antecedent agreement. In both cases, the, the beneficiary has said to the fiduciary, "You can have fifty percent." I mean, the, the my my lord's my lord's question to me would lead to this distinction. In a case where SCPI owns a hundred percent. My argument would fail because it wouldn't have the necessary deterrent, equity wouldn't have the necessary deterrent effect. Um, in, a, in a case where SCPI had 100% and then had agreed to put all the profits into a company owed 50 50, w would there be the necessary deterrent effect or not? It, it, well, if, if, if you own 50%, equity doesn't need to deter you from taking your own 
it needs to deter you from taking the other party's 50 percent. Well, but you it's a completely you, different situation. You, 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 yes, you, you still you still have a, a, a freeway bet or a shot to nothing on on the other 50 percent. If, if my lord is concerned about the deterrent effect, you, you can't get round it there. I understand you're pivoting towards that. I still don't hear any answer as to why as to why why you should be able to do this. But let me you, you pivot back to it and say, well, look at the anti. Okay, understand that point. But that's why. But that's why because you're in, in both cases. Like my lord's happy to accept, as I understand in, in this debate, that in a case where there is an anti agreement that it's fifty fifty. Well, because unlike it, because unlike you, I see a, a complete difference. In which case, that is the real point between us. That's what I'm trying to get to. The real point between us, my lord, is not really, if, if I may say respectfully, is not really the point my lord is now putting to me, either the deterrence effect point. That is a consequence, if I may respectfully submit, of the underlying point between us, which is my lord is drawing a distinction between the 50-50 equity case and the interest in profits case. Once once my lord takes issue with me on that point, all sorts of consequences are going to flow. That's why I accept that I, that's why I, start, I started with the point at 42, the circumscribing the principal's interest point, because it is so important for my argument. Well, your answer to it, then is, your answer to it is then that equity is toothless in, either, in, either, in all situations. It's not toothless. I, I, would, I would now respectfully adopt what my lord put to me. It's not toothless because equity is saying, just as in a case where you had agreed by way of contract that 50% was theirs, and therefore that's, so to speak, out of the picture, equity has no business in looking at that 50% because that's always theirs. So it is in a case where you've agreed that they have a 50% profit share. It's the same thing. Equity is not operating on the 50% which the beneficiary has always agreed with the fiduciary that the fiduciary could have, whether that's by way of binding contracts of an equity share, or whether that's by way of, for example, a profit share. And, and that's why th that, it seems to me, is the fundamental, is, is sort of the underlying point that, on, on which this exchange is pivoting. Um, I was just about to conclude my submissions on the um, legally uh, binding point. Uh, does it have to be legally binding? Um, and I then got into the exchange with my Lord Lord Justice Phillips. The only other point I was going to uh, just remind the court of here uh, is that in, in Warman, uh, where the High Court of Australia refers in Warman uh, uh, to the fact that a profit share would operate to limit the account, it refers to an antecedent arrangement. Now, I don't put that too high. Um, it's interesting that they don't say antecedent contract or binding agreement. It's antecedent arrangement. Um, it is the High Court uh, of Australia. I, I do submit that that gives force to my submission that what we're looking at here is an underlying commercial deal or arrangement between the parties. So that's the first point. Does it have to be legally binding? The second point. Um, if the agreement has to be legally binding, we say this one was. And as I set out earlier, um, at, at the moment, uh, because that's all I can do standing here at the moment, I propose to identify the reasons why the judge said it was not legally binding and deal with those. I certainly didn't understand the claimants to be taking uh, any other point as to why the agreement uh, might not be uh, an agreement binding in law. They, they do take a point as to whether the points which we attack in this part of the appeal are questions of fact or law. Um, it didn't strike me that that's a point on which this appeal is likely to turn. Um, as to that, we, we simply make the, the uh, simple point that there are, there are factual findings in the judgment as to whether there was an accord or understanding or arrangement between the parties. And then there's a legal question as to whether that accord represents a binding contract. Um, so uh, I can ask a witness, did you 
So far as you were concerned, had you reached an agreement with Mr. Snooks? That's a permissible question. Uh, if I ask, well, was that agreement legally binding? Obviously, that's an impermissible question because the answer is irrelevant and probably inadmissible. Um, we certainly contend that we are on the right side of this line. We are only attacking the legal consequences flowing from uh, the uh, judgment. Uh, there are three bases on which the judge held that the agreement, the arrangement, was not a binding contract. Uh, let me deal with each in turn. The first and main reason we see at 4.30 of the judgment, and that is that no agreement had yet been made with the family. The court sees that the learned judge regards this as the problem, capital the, at the beginning of 4.30, and treats this as an obviously, uh, an obvious and necessarily correct point. Uh, one can see this from the way she puts, without that, an agreement as to entitlements in respect of that work could not be in place. <coughs> and she says it's a case of putting the cart before the horse. We respectfully say that the learned judge has identified the cart as the horse and the horse as the cart because we do respectfully say that as a matter, it is commonplace. I mean, this isn't a matter of evidence. It's simply an understanding of the way people do business that joint venturers might well, and we would say often do, agree between themselves how they're going to divide up the spoils before there are any spoils, before there is any agreement with an intended counterparty, before they've agreed how to structure their JV. So it is simply not right to say that there could not be an agreement between them because they hadn't yet done an agreement with the family. One of the first things joint venturers do is to agree how to slice the cake between themselves. Uh, and they do that before there's a cake, uh, often before they've even gone shopping for the ingredients. So the, the point at 4.30, uh, we say, is uh, plainly a bad reason. Uh, and that also goes for the third sentence of 4.3.4. Four. Um, there was no substance to which an agreement as to future revenues arising from the recovery services could, another could, could attach. So that's the, that's the first reason the judge gives there's no binding agreement, that there was no agreement with the family. We say that's a bad reason. Second is what the judge says at 427, where, and I think this was a point um, uh, highlighted earlier by my Lord Lord Justice Phillips, I think, um, the lack of focus by these parties on formal contracts or the English law requirements for a contract. Uh, and the simple point in response here uh, is that it's never been part of English law that parties have to focus on formality or the English law requirements for a contract. Uh, the claimants uh, did not take it and not taking any point as to intention to create legal relations. Uh, and as to the party's subjective views on the formal requirements, for contracts in English law. Um, this is a good e example of why the court doesn't normally look at that. Um, that's why I wasn't going to go to our pleadings, I wasn't going to go to their pleadings. Uh, our pleadings would only be irrelevant, would only be relevant if some sort of estoppel point was being taken against me, uh, which uh, it, it isn't. But one, one of the English law requirements is an intention to create legal relations. Yes. And you, and you say we, we, we don't have to worry about that because the point's not being taken. That was one of the things she had in mind. I didn't catch the last bit, my lord. It's not been taken against me, and because it wasn't one of the things yes. the judge had in mind. Yes, yes, and 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 the, as to intention to create legal relations, um, when if we if I, if we need to get to it, when joint venturers say, sit down and say, well, we'll agree how we're going to structure this. There'll be a lot of work to do, but let's just nail one thing down. This is 50-50. In my respectful submission, it's clear and obvious that they're intending to create legal relations, and that 50-50 is going to be binding between them. That it, it, indeed, it's such a fundamental point. Indeed, that's why they would normally discuss it first up. That, that there's plainly intention to create legal relations as to that 50-50. There may be no obligation to go on and actually do the joint venture. 
that may be a different point. But if you go on and do a joint venture, that 50-50 has been agreed, and there is intention to create legal relations as to that 50-50. That's why they're discussing it. They're not discussing it as a matter of abstract theology. They're discussing it as a matter of real-world business, and that is going to be the bedrock of their joint venture. So if I, if I, if I, need, to, um, if I need to deal with an intention to create legal relations point in and of itself, uh, my Lord, respectfully, that's my answer to it. But what also comes out of 47, it seems to me, is that I think what the judge is saying is there was no contractual certainty here. Things were in a state of flux. And, and so though there were discussions and understandings, they were short of a contract. Isn't that a, isn't that a, isn't that a, a finding of fact, that here there were, there were things were in a state of flux and they never matured into the, into the certainty that should be required for a contract? Well, one has to distinguish between um, what, what, is, what is in a state of flux here and what isn't. I, I, I've already accepted that, that the, the structure is, is in a state of flux. But the 50-50 is not in a state of flux. The 50-50, we respectfully submit, is, um, uh, is, the, um, uh, is, is the point which well, was... I thought, I thought you accepted that they hadn't even necessarily finalised 50-50. It was in the region of 50 the, it, it is fair to say, and I, I thought I um, uh, realistically accepted this earlier, that there were um, there was there was chiselling around the fifty fifty. But um, we we submit that uh, by the time um, the um, the breach took place, uh, the parties were working on the basis of, of an understanding as to fifty fifty. Where's the finding of that? The, well, I mean, where, where we get to is, is really at 431. And, and, and it's, a, it's a point I, I took the court to earlier. My, my Lord will put, to, will put to me the words somewhere in the region of, yeah. in, four, in 431. And I will say, in, in respectfully in response, that the judge says this was reflected in the email at 432, which is his team would have perfected their interest in 50% of the recovery proceeds. No, but her finding of fact, which you're not challenging, is that, that that they would have a right to dictate the allocation of somewhere in the region of 50%. I mean, that's, that's what she's found. What that suggests is when she refers to the 50% uh, in the email, that's to be interpreted as simply a common understanding that it was to be somewhere in that region. They hadn't actually agreed specifically on 50%. But the email, when it talked... Is to be interpreted as meaning something in the regional. Well, th this is this is Mr. Jaffe's email, and in my respectful submission, he's very clear there that he's talking about affecting their interest in fifty percent. And given that the learner judge says that this that what she says in four three one is reflected in four three two, uh, the way I would invite the court to read that is that the uh, statement in four three two as to fifty percent is what she's saying was the deal between the parties. But the words are That's there on the page. Yeah. Now you're putting switching around cart and horse. Four, four three two is the evidence that she is referring to. Her conclusion is in four three one, and I, I understand that you're not challenging her conclusions of fact. Well, I, I, of course I'm not challenging the, the conclusion. Of well, fact, how can you get how can you get away from her conclusion of fact that there was a common understanding, uh, right to dictate the allocation of somewhere in the region of fifty percent. But the, the because what I think is just the answer I've just given, my lord, that um, she says somewhere in the region of fifty percent, and then this was reflected. Um, I mean, we can we can go through the um, we can go through the judgment, but that is that is the um, uh, the the, um, the the way the, the judge approached it. So what you're so saying is we should just we should interpret what she says in four three one in the light of what. She, of, in the light of what was that she recorded was said in an email in four three two. Yeah. Yes. I mean, to, to put this in context, if my lord goes back to four two five, 
The defendant's case was that there was any insistence of binding the agreement for 50% not conditional upon any global deal. Now, uh, my understanding is that the way this point came up was that we were saying that we uh, had 50% uh, on an unconditional basis. Um, Mr. Jaffe was saying 46% with 4% conditional on a global deal. Uh, and, and that's why the judge says about uh, 50%. And, and um, my Lord sees that in 425 in the uh, reference to Mr. Jaffe's evidence. I do accept, I promised you actually initially 40%, then increased to 50, 46%, and then I was willing to increase it to 50% should we agree on everything else. And that's where, that's where we end up. Um, my Lord, the, um, the third point um, relied on by the judge as to why there was no binding deal was, uh, was the point about Mr. Jaffe being able to move around the shares of SCPI executives uh, without a formal process. This is a point at 429. Um, uh, th this is, we uh, respectfully submit, is a red herring point. <coughs> uh, the short point is that the what's referred to there as a Kira Gabbert spreadsheet, uh, which is referred to back in uh, uh, in four two six as well, uh, that reflected from time to time both the economic deal between the Park Street team and the Pall Mall team, i.e., Jaffe and the Council, and also the internal economic allocation within Mr. Jaffe's team. So the most that Mr. Jaffe could do and did was to allocate the 50% within his team. So that point doesn't go anywhere. He, he can deal with his 50%, uh, but he can't uh, deal with our uh, 50%. That's the point we make at 35.2 of our written argument. So those are the reasons why the learned judge held, as a matter of law, the arrangement which she had found existed between the parties didn't amount to a binding contract. Uh, and for the reasons which I've submitted, uh, we say that she was wrong, and this court uh, should find that, uh, therefore, there was. Um, it's at this point that the revocation on breach point comes into the analysis, because if the agreement has to be binding, and if it was binding, Logically, this is where the revocation point fits in. This is the point that uh, where the judge uh, concludes that if there uh, was an agreement, uh, if there had been an agreement between the parties, um, it wouldn't have helped me uh, because it would have been one which re uh, provided for revocation in the event of breach. This point she deals with towards the end of the judgment. The court will find it at 624 of the judgment, at page 242 of the uh, bundle. The court sees that it's a relatively short section. Uh, and of course, it starts off at 619 by saying, in the event that I'm wrong about the issue as to the so-called profit-sharing agreement, the question then arises as to the revocability of that agreement. Because of course, as I've said, it only arises if you need an agreement and you have one and it is binding. The point here, uh, the conclusion at 624, is the reality is there was no agreement. Fine. I conclude that if there had been an agreement, it would have been one that provided for revocation in the event of breach. Now, the, the short answer to this is that the judge's use of the subjunctive there is where we say the judge goes wrong. Because at this stage of the analysis, we're not talking about an agreement which would be reached at some point in the future. We're talking about an agreement which was reached. Now, I don't want to overanalyze the use of the subjunctive, but just to be clear, the question which the learned judge either should have or was asking herself was not if there was, if, if the parties in the future made an agreement, would it have included a term, express or impliedly, uh, for revocation on breach? The question is, did. And our answer to that uh, question is uh, a short one, 
It's one I think I've already had a short exchange with my Lord or Justice Popperwell about. And it's to say, uh, A, there was plainly no express term for revocation uh, once there is a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, does it satisfy the test for an implied term? Well, as to that, um, one, one does have first to identify what the implied term was. That was the short exchange which I had with my Lord. Uh, if my Lord prefers my Lord's implied term to mine, i.e. more focused on this particular breach, the question then becomes, is it obvious that in those circumstances, when you've had a, I would say, only had a bad faith resignation, you're obviously disentitled from the entirety of the 50% which you'd agreed with the other contracting party that you would have. When it comes to an implied term, of course, I don't have to persuade the court that I'm, so to speak, right on the point in the sense that um, it's obvious that that term would not be implied. The question is whether it's obvious that the term would be implied. And I do respectfully submit that it's far from obvious that that term would be implied in circumstances where, as I say, this isn't a putting your hand in the till case, and we're necessarily talking about a case by this stage of the analysis where the parties have otherwise agreed on a binding contract basis that I can have 50%. So the idea that the officious bystander or a necessary test or obvious, however we now want to look at this question, would say, well, it's obvious that no matter that if you have a bad faith resignation, you necessarily lose the entirety of your 50%. My short submission is that that doesn't meet the but is that, requirements and implied terms. Is that the question the officious bystander w would have asked? You've got Mr. Jaff and you've got Mr. Hadsey. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name. Uh, I don't suppose they're very familiar with the principles of equity or the disgorgement of profits. If at the, if, if at the time of this uh, agreement you said to them, uh, if you, the Park Street team, uh, go off and turn the family against the Pall Mall team and do all the work, uh, will you have to pay half of the profits to Mr Jaff? Would Mr Rickardsey say, yes, yes, of course we will. We quite understand. We, we can only keep half of them, although we're doing all the work. I, that's not a proposition I find self-evident. Well, the, the question is whether... And on the, on the other side, well, uh, I, I dare say Mr Jaff would have said, of course not, but in terms of Mr. Rickardsey keeping all the profits himself. Well, but the, the, my, my submission is that if the parties had been asked that, then certainly Mr. Mr. Rickardsey would have said, well, just a minute, if you're positing a situation where I've done something I shouldn't have done, but I've gone away and I've done the deal with the family, which if I hadn't done what you're saying I did wrong, I could have done, and I've actually done the deal, I'm put in all the work and made all the money, are you telling me that, do I agree in those circumstances to give it lock, stock and barrel to Mr Jaffe? Well, of course you would have said no. In my surely, surely, surely what they would actually have said is, well, hold on a minute, this 50-50 this deal we had assumed that we were going to go forward as joint venturers. Of course all bets are off. Mr Rickardsey have said, we're entitled to go off and do this, and if we do the work, we'll get all the profit. Mr. Jaff would have said you're not entitled to do it and you're not entitled to any part of the profit if you do it. But, but, I, I mean, that strikes me as what they would have testily suppressed the official <laughs> bystander with, if that's the, the old fashioned language we're allowed to use. I always feel sorry for the official bystander. I mean, he, 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 he or she is officious, but they do get a bit of, they do get it in the neck a bit for the contracting parties. But is that not more realistic? But, but, but if it is, there's still no implied term. It is. The implied term is, if if, if you do what you in fact did, all bets are off. I mean, that's putting well, it loosely. A, it's a breakdown of the relationship. Well, but, but is it? I mean, the, the well, one can quite see um, why, in circumstances where they say, um, if you, in a case where you take an opportunity which doesn't belong to you, but in a case where, like this, a bad faith resignation, I, I, I do respectfully submit that it is far from obvious that the parties would have agreed, uh, or the officials by standard would have said, um, in circumstances where you have a bad faith resignation, but you thereafter go on to do that which you would otherwise have been entitled to do and make all this money, it's, it's obvious that you have no right 
to the entire 100%, because on the assumption that that's where equity gets us. Um, and it's all there for renewals for Mr. Jackson's benefit. I think, the, if I may say respectfully, the officious bystander would regard that as extremely surprising and not a, and not a just result. It's a, it's a result which, um, not least because, and it maybe at this stage this is where this is point is, is more relevant, it equates the result in this case with the result in a putting your hand in the till case. But that's a legal consequence. It's not a question for the officious bystander, is it? We're looking at what the terms of the putative terms of the contract are. Yes, but when, when the officious bystander or the party say, well, all bets are off, what do they mean by all bets are off? What they really mean is, well, um, we'll, we'll, we're therefore mean, subject to whatever the law says we're subject to. But they might mean it's, it's clearly understood that in those circumstances, the joint venture, the partnership, perhaps to use it in a very non-technical sense, is over. The parties have gone their separate ways. The, the, whether the joint venture is over, the question is whether the agreement that we would have 50% necessarily falls away with it. That's, I mean, that, that, that's a point we're, we're focused on here. And, um, well, I don't want to repeat myself, but I think that is the answer I give, which is that um, it, it is far from obvious, we would say, that um, somebody looking at it, or Mr. Ricadze, somebody in Mr. Ricadze's position, would say, well, in no circumstances, when all I've done is the bad faith resignation. And I say all, not, not, not to say it's not a fiduciary breach, it, it is a breach of fiduciary duty, but it's not putting your hands in the till, it's not nicking company property. When, when all I've done is that, um, do I agree that all bets are off, the whole relationship is at end? They would say, well, just a minute, what does that mean? And if they were then told, well, actually what it means is that the entire profit goes to Mr. Jaffin, they'd say, well, come on, that's not fair. No, that isn't the question. Is it? It, it, the question is, would they still have said, well, of course, our 50-50 agreement is still going to subsist. Or would they have said, well, obviously, that was uh, in, agreed under entirely different circumstances, namely, we were going to, still going to be joint venturers. So, I, I, and, and isn't that the question? It's not whether they would have agreed something different. It's whether they would have agreed that what, what, they'd, what they'd said before was no longer going to apply. And, and in, in those circumstances, uh, somebody in position, Mr. Ricadzi, will say, well, in the circumstances you're positing, I've gone away there's a bad faith resignation, but I've gone away and done that which I would otherwise be entitled to do. I've done it in the same way, or perhaps even more strongly. I've worked really, really hard. I've got all this money in. Yeah. Um, of course, of course, you're not going to. Of course, course you, Mr. Jaffa, not going to get your fifty percent. That's the problem, isn't it? Well, that's what he would have said. Well, at the very he, least, he wouldn't. He wouldn't say yes. No, I agree. Let's let's still do it on a fifty-fifty basis. Well, at the very, he he would say um, the fifty-fifty. My respect to you say the 50-50 applies, because that's the basis on which we're working. Right. Thank you. Would you accept that, that um, on, on the events that, that occurred, any contract would have been repudiated? Um, I'm not sure I, I accept that. Uh, there's certainly not a point which has been raised before, but I'm not, I'm not sure I accept that, and I'm not sure if, it, if there was a repudiated breach where there was an acceptance. But, I, mean, I didn't ask you about it. No, no, I appreciate you didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, would, would it amount to repudiation? Um, you've, agreed, you've, agreed to share the, you've agreed to share the profits 50-50, yes. but you resign and then go and enter the business deal yourself. Yeah. You don't think that would, that would be a repudiation? On the basis, on the, perhaps it ties into the point my Lord Lord Justice Popper put to me. On, on the basis that my argument is, well, um, you say I'm resigning, I'm going to do this, um, but if I have to pay over 50% to you, well, I'll have to pay over 50% to you. That wouldn't be a repudiatory breach. Right. The, I think perhaps the question is... It's highly likely then that if the contract continued, so did a repudiatory relationship. Um, it, it might do, but... In which case you were stealing it stealing a business opportunity all, uh, the way, all the way along. No, I think it's, it's accepted that the fiduciary, that we, we have to proceed here on the basis that the only fiduciary breach found was the bad faith resignation. There's no, there was no fiduciary breach other than that found against my client. 
But a breach, of, du- a b- breach of a duty of loyalty is treated as a paradigm example for a beautiful breach in, in relationships where the fiduciary, the fiduciary relationship exists. Yes. Employer, employee. Um, That's why. And, I was... and, and I mean, why different in, in this joint venture context? It, it, because in the um, in this in this context. Um, when you have a uh, somebody who says, "Look, I'm going to go off and uh, do this on my own. I could resign without doing the parity step, so to speak, and, and go off and do it on my own uh, and make all the profit. Um, I committed these parity steps. I've now gone off and made it on my own. Uh, but and this is where we are in this case. Uh, I'm only arguing to attain 50% of what I've made." In those circumstances, I do submit that it's far from clear. But that's a different that factual, that that's, that's, that's factually different from this case. What happened in this case is that what was done was done clandestinely and without any acceptance as to what the money would have been. It's one thing to say, uh, I know I shouldn't be doing this, strictly speaking, but uh, if I do, the legal consequences are uh, that I uh, will have to pay you 50% of the profit. So actually, you're you're, you're no worse off, so I'm not really being disloyal. But that isn't what happened. <laughs> well, I, I do take issue respectfully with, with the word clandestinely. I mean, one of the points we'll get to on the delay argument is that actually Mr. Jaffe knew what was going on and took a decision to uh, wait and see. I mean, th- th- and that, that, that will be important on the delay argument, but it may also be important here, I mean, th- th- this was this was where we went off, and we. And I'm, I'm repeating myself. I'm sorry. We, we did that which we were otherwise entitled to do. Um, I, I, of course, I accept that there are cases uh, where loyalty is the essential uh, uh, element of the contract, and we do see that in contracts of employment. Uh, but I uh, respectfully don't accept that it's necessarily the case that what we did here would amount to a repudiatory breach. So the waterfall of arguments here is one, we don't need a binding agreement. Two, if we do need one, we've got one. Three, if we do need one uh, and we had one, then it didn't contain the term for automatic revocation on breach. If we're wrong on all of those, uh, i.e. we had an arrangement or understanding, but it wasn't a binding agreement in law, or we had a binding agreement in law, but it was revoked, then we do say that that is very strong, uh, in fact, the best evidence as to the value of our services uh, and what we should get by way of an allowance. And it's at that point that I, so to speak, hand over metaphorically to Melinda Fett. Uh, before I conclude my submissions on this ground, can I make two further relatively short points? Um, Uh, another uh, point taken by my learned friend uh, is that if one adduced uh, clear and relevant evidence from uh, an independent uh, expert that one's services were worth 50% of the profits for the purposes of an equitable allowance, uh, the court could award 50% without there being any policy <coughs> objection. Uh, so we, we do say in those uh, circumstances uh, that the fact, if this is where we get to, that we end up with an understanding with the claimant that we should get at 50%, i.e. with the person who had the best interest in valuing what our services would be worth, uh, that would be a very relevant uh, 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 piece of material for the uh, equitable uh, allowance. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to deal briefly in this case, in this part, if I may, with um, O'Sullivan, uh, which my learned friend Mr. Burton may come back to. Um, but uh, can I just take the court to O'Sullivan? My learned friend takes it on this point. Um, o- O'Sullivan is in the authorities bundle. I think it's at tab 11. Tab 11. will be familiar with this case. This is the music industry 
had a case where the contract was vitiated for undue influence. And importantly in this case, and we see this at 308 to 309 per Lord Justice uh, Foff, and in particular the passage at uh, 309 in the bundle between A and C. The important thing to remember on O'Sullivan is that the contract for profit share was the very contract which had been vitiated by the defendant's undue influence, which is why the court was of the view that he should suffer not receiving the amount which he could have got had it been properly negotiated. Uh, that is obviously different uh, to our case. Second, the other distinction of O'Sullivan is that this is a case where the court is dealing with an alternative universe. Uh, it was dealing with the expert opinion, I think it's a Mr. Levinson, um, as to what could have been negotiated within the bargain that would have taken place if the parties had received proper advice untainted by undue influence. Again, that's not this case. We have real world evidence as to what Mr. Jaffe was willing to agree and pay my clients in this case, and therefore how he valued uh, the work. And we do uh, invite the court, in addition to the passages cited by Milena Friend from the judgment of Lord Justice Fox, to pick up the approach of Lord Justice Waller at 312 to 313. Um, I'm afraid we haven't highlighted this, uh, and that's, that's my fault, and I'm, I apologise. But uh, we do invite the court to look at 312 in the bundle, just below C in the present case, uh, through to um, uh, 313, just before D. And the point made there by uh, Lord Justice Waller uh, is that the court should uh, ensure the claimant gets the profit to which he's entitled. At the same time, the defendants receive fair remuneration for the work they've done in pursuance of the project, which can include a share of the profits at which the defendants helped to make and without whom it would not have been made. So that's, that's a short point on O'Sullivan. I won't say any more because I will otherwise trespass into the other appeal. Um, the, the second short point which I should say, uh, let make at this point, is to pick up a what seems to be a somewhat of a final throw of the dice by the claimant. Uh, to say that if I'm right so far, um, the learned professor, Mr. Cogley, uh, threw away uh, $44.5 million uh, in the course of a subphrase of a partial sentence. Um, this is the uh, point when uh, they refer to the transcript uh, at supplementary bundle uh, tab 35 at 558. Uh, uh, I, I think I should deal with this um, perhaps briefly without taking the court to it. And I'll deal with it in reply if it really becomes an important point. We, we, have, read, we have read the passage. The, the, the short point is we don't understand Malone's uh, predecessor to be making any concessions. Uh, he was simply suggesting, entirely wrongly, if I may say, that our pleaded or written case was that we would claim only 40% by way of equitable allowance. Uh, and uh, that was factually uh, wrong, uh, to the extent that he was saying it was legally correct that we could <coughs> 50% uh, or conceding that we wouldn't, uh, he was wrong uh, on, on both. Um, Uh, finally, in our skeleton, we refer, we, we say that there are no authorities directly in point on the 50-50 uh, argument, and we do, we do stand by that. Um, we do refer somewhat in passing in our <coughs> to two authorities, uh, which, uh, although they don't deal with the point head on, uh, we say are nonetheless uh, helpful uh, to us. Um, so uh, perhaps I should show the court uh, then briefly. Um, the first is Murad and al-Saraj, which is at tab 18 
of the authorities bundle. I will do this fairly briefly because we, we accept that these are unlikely to, to give the court the answer. But since there are passages which touch on the point, uh, I just want to make sure the court has them. The first bit in uh, Al Siraj is at 535, at paragraph 85. That's a dictum of uh, Lady Justice uh, Arden, uh, as she uh, then was, um, which we've quoted in our written arguments. Uh, and uh, we say, picking up the phrase of uh, uh, the Lady Justice, that the 50% in this case were monies to which uh, we were always, in, always entitled for our own uh, account. Uh, we've also, uh, we also invite the court to look at paragraph 87. And 87 is relevant because the reason why the court in this case considered that the line of authority relied on by Mr. Al Siraj to support his claim for a, pof for a profit share didn't have been was because his profit share was only hypothetical. This really is a hypothetical case, i.e. it was an agreement that he said he would have entered into if he had not breached his duties. Uh, paragraph 76 makes the same point. Uh, and, and we say that the uh, consequence uh, is, in, in 87, if there had actually been uh, an agreement for that profit, profit share, uh, then uh, he would have uh, been successful in his entitlement. And we, of course, argue that we do have that uh, agreement. Um, the second case, which we've referred to in this context, is Keystone and Parr. This is at tab 25. The court has these on paper. It's in bundle three of the authorities bundle tab 25. Um, the, the facts are fairly neatly summarized on the first. Page. Essentially, Mr. Parr had committed a fraud on the company, of which he was a director and a shareholder. Uh, in breach of fiduciary duty to report his own wrongdoing, he didn't tell his co-directors and co-shareholders, who were Mr. and Mrs. Ward, what he'd done. They subsequently acquired his shares for full value. Had he told them about the fraud, the compulsory purchase provisions in the articles and the shareholders' agreement had the effect that Mr. and Mrs. Ward could have purchased his shares at 50% of their value. And so the Ward sought an account of profits for 50% of the value, which they said was the profit he'd made from his breach of fiduciary duty. Uh, and we see that in paragraph 4, and in particular the last bit of paragraph 4. Um, the court will see that Regal Hastings is cited paragraph 10. Uh, so the court obviously had the relevant principles in mind. And uh, turning to the uh, towards the end of the judgment, uh, 23, uh, one sees the argument that uh, he was only entitled to receive, just halfway through the paragraph, half of that value under the terms of the Articles of Association, the shareholders' agreement, his concealment of his breach of duty, which was itself a breach of duty, led to his receipt of twice as much as he was entitled to. In my judgment, that's a sufficient connection between the breach and the profit to bring the equitable principle into play. Now, of course, I have to accept that no claim was being made for Mr. Parr's other 50%, so the court didn't rule on it. But the point we do take from this authority is that it was considered obvious by the court, uh, while citing Regal and expressing the relevant principles, and ruling on whether the other 50% should fall into the account, it was considered obvious that the first 50%, so to speak, uh, was untouchable. Uh, and we say that's because of the reasons we gave earlier. This was a case where there was a binding, real-world, non-hypothetical contract which applied to the profit claimed. And also, it was a second category type of case, i.e. the receipt of the money was not itself the breach of duty. 
So I hope fairly I, I'm accepting that the Keystone, so to speak, doesn't necessarily get me home. But when one reads Keystone, we do say that it's an authority of this court which uh, supports us. Uh, my very final point on, 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 this, on, on these submissions, on my appeal, uh, is to remind the court that, of course, in this case, the profits which we earned were subject to a hurdle. And it's interesting to bring into play the effect of that hurdle when one tests the arguments which I've been submitting to the court and the points that the court has been putting to me during the course of the morning. Um, let's just make the hurdle facts a little bit easier. So A and B agree that they will pursue a venture. A will uh, get the first 100 million of profit, and that thereafter they'll split the profits 50-50. Um, a commits a bad faith resignation, then goes on to work really hard on the opportunity which, like in our case, if he hadn't committed a bad faith resignation, he could have got for himself anyway works really hard, but he only makes 85 million. Why can't he say, I ask rhetorically, well, to be, you can have an account of profits, but we'd agreed that I was always going to get the first hundred, and there are simply no profits as far as you're concerned. We agreed you were never going to get anything unless and until 100 million was earned, and the profits never exceeded that hurdle. The only available answer would be to say, well, um, because of the bad faith resignation, that agreement falls away, and every single pound which A makes, B can get. And as I say, the, you know, where I started from, the problem with that is that, first of all, we say it is contrary to uh, the principles we've set out. And it puts A in exactly the same position as a party who had misappropriated or taken the asset uh, for himself, when precisely that is not what this case is. So it's another way of, of, of putting, perhaps a little more starkly, the point where we started by putting the hurdle into it. But otherwise, my lords, um, that is what I was going to say on our appeal. Now it's now going to move on to the second round. I don't know whether my lords want me to start now or to... Yes, go on, please. So moving on to delay, the judge's approach to this point was hard-edged. Um, her approach is that delay either gives you a total defence to the claim, if it amounts to a defence of late cheese, in which case you, you're not entitled to an account at all because your claim fails, or it's totally irrelevant. That's the judge's approach. Um, the total defence would be that you've brought the claim today, but you've delayed until today for so long but you get nothing because it's just too late uh, and that operates as a defence to the whole claim. And of course we acknowledge, agree and accept that there is such a total defence. Our case on delay is not that the delay for which we contend replaces, it adds to the existing law. Um, so therefore we accept that there <coughs> are cases where delay is a total defence to the claim, you get nothing, but we don't accept that it follows from that, that delay always has that all or nothing effect and delay can only operate in that way. Um, rather, and again to, to pick up but not to take the court to again at this point, uh, the way the Australian High Court put it in Warman, uh, and the reference is 371, page 371 of tab 13, um, quotes, it's necessary to keep steadily in mind the cardinal principle of equity that the remedy must be fashioned to fit the nature of the case and the particular facts. Now, we'll come to the Australian cases, and the court will have seen that we rely heavily on Murdoch, an Australian case in this context. Uh, but I was going to start with an English case, uh, because if I can show my forensic uh, hand for a moment, um, I recognise that if I can't uh, persuade the court on the basis of the English authorities, and that's not where the court wants to go as a matter of principle. Uh, showing the court's Australian authorities is unlikely in itself uh, to get me there. So let me start with the English uh, authority. And um, again, as we've said in our written argument, 
we accept that these are not directly on our point, but we do uh, can, uh, submit that they are helpful. Um, I want to show the court clay um, because it's one of the oldest cases, and no doubt for that reason appears at tab one in the authorities bundle, uh, and indeed it's cited in all the uh, later cases. And for the court's note, we do make in our written case at tab 51. Um, Clegg, well, Clegg was a case where the managing partners dissolved the partnership and then carried on the business for their benefit, having obtained a renewed lease, which ought to have been obtained and retained for the partnership. And there were two factual points which are important to understand for this case. The first is, and we've set this out in our paragraph 52, on the facts, all the profits were made in the period after the excluded partners had notice of what was going on. We see that from the report of page four of the uh, bundle pagination in the paragraph beginning in the year 1846. So factually, all the profits were made in the period after the excluded partners knew what was going on. And therefore, that necessarily means that there were no profits which were earned in the period before the old partners could justifiably be criticised for sitting on their hands and seeing how things would work out. That's just the way the particular cookie crumbled, if I can put it that way, in this case. And therefore, it's not surprising, therefore, that Clegg doesn't directly deal with the particular point I'm going to be submitting because there was nothing on which it could bite on the fact. The second factual point is that while the old partners did jump up and down about the breach and sent some letters, and we see this on page six in the, um, in the middle of the page, uh, they actually took no action to prosecute the claim. So when you look at the, the underlying uh, ratio of the case, and we, we have a judgment from uh, Lord Justice uh, Turner, uh, starting on page uh, 9, and uh, Lord Justice Knight Bruce starting on page 11. Uh, we say that the perhaps the most pithy way it's put uh, is on page 12 in the judgment of Lord Justice Knight Bruce. And the paragraph in the middle beginning, this argument is plausible but hasn't convinced me, uh, where, um, where he says, um, in such cases, uh, well, he, he makes the point of mind is in the nature of a trade carried on, requires time, care, attention, and skill, besides the possible expenditure and risk of capital, uh, nor can any degree of science, etc., afford a sure guarantee. So, in other words, it's risky. And then somebody who has an adverse claim in equity should pursue it promptly, not by empty words, should show himself in good time, willing to participate in possible loss as well as profit, and not play a game. And we submit that it necessarily follows from that that if profits are earned in a period before you are aware of the issue, as in Clegg, at that time you can't be criticised and you're entitled to the profit. But what you can't do, and we say this is implicit in Clegg and follows from the approach of both Lord Justices, but in particular Lord Justice Knight Bruce, is what you can't do is to stand by and wait and see. And um, if I've got my uh, children's fables correct. You can't uh, be like the animals with the little red hen. Allow the little red hen to do all the work, just stand around, and then say, well, thanks very much, you baked some bread, I now will have a, a bit of it. Um, you've got to either say, right, you're, you're doing something which you're not entitled to do, and I'm going to vindicate my rights, and I'll come to what the judge said about that, or you have to show yourself to be willing to participate in the risk. What you can't do is hedge it. You can't wait and see, and just see which way um, things things work out. Um, uh, my Lord, I, I don't know whether the little red hen is going to be the best authority for my case today, but that is the point I was going to uh, invite the court to take the short break. Um, I've got, um, uh, obviously, some more submissions on delay, uh, but, uh, my Lord, I still think I'm on target to finish ahead of schedule, as I intimated at the outset. Thank you. Took up.